Thanks for joining us on YouTube. This is our podcast, Travel Agent Chatter. And if you want to make sure you never miss another episode, or if you want to try it in another format, make sure to try it out on your favorite podcast player, whether it be Apple Podcasts or Google Play. Check it out. And also make sure you never miss another episode here on YouTube if you prefer the video format by subscribing to our channel. I'm not exactly sure where the button is, so I'm going to guess here or here. And you can check out our show notes by clicking the link to our episode page, which has the show notes, as well as a transcript of the show and the podcast embedded in it. And that, again, I'm going to guess um, is going to be up here, maybe, or up here. You can click the link. Let's get into the show. To Travel Agent Chatter, Volume 14. I'm Steph Lee, the founder of Host Agency Reviews and your host for today's show. In today's episode, we're getting experimental. Instead of our usual one-on-one -on -one interviews, we're doing a group interview with my favorite travel podcast host. Travel Agent Chatter is an audio series produced by the team here at Host Agency Reviews every quarter. If you missed the last episode, we've got an ambitious 2020 campaign going where we're aiming to hit 20 new podcast ratings in 2020. We're almost halfway there and I'd love for you to leave us a review or rating to help us reach our goal. Mm -hmm. Yep, right now that's you pausing the podcast. Yep, good. Glad to see you scrolling up, yep, or down. To find the ratings and review section. Uh, bam, you hit that five star rating like a pro. Easy peasy. And that, my friends, was our call to action for our podcast, which is one of the many things we'll be talking about later with our guests. So come along as we discuss how you should turn that idea of a podcast into a reality. By the end of this, starting a podcast will no longer feel intimidating. You'll hear from multiple hosts how they do things, and you'll feel a lot more comfortable knowing there are many different ways to approach a podcast. But don't you worry. We're not going to leave you without a roadmap. We're going to give you plenty of ideas of different ways you can nail your very own podcast to help you get clients. So settle in and listen up, because this two-part series is chock full of information. And now, let's get on to the show. Ugh. Let's get the elephant out of the room, shall we? How about this pandemic? I know, I know. It's crazy times in the travel industry right now. I know your income has dropped off a cliff. Uh, you're spending hours on hold, rebooking and canceling clients. And you're wondering when this is all going to pick up. Well, I don't have an answer for you on that, but what I can do is take you away from the on-hold music and grounded aircraft for just a little while. Today, we're going to be tossing things up here at Travel Asian Chatter. Instead of doing um, our usual one-on-one -on -one interview, we're going to have a freaking party in the house. There is no social distance happening on this podcast, which means that we may run um, a bit longer than usual. And I figured if there was a time to have a longer podcast, the time to do it is now, when I literally have a captive audience stuck in their homes. So thank you, coronavirus. Um, the gaggle we're hanging out with today is going to share with you their podcasting knowledge and hopefully get your wheels turning on how a podcast might help you drum up some new business for your agency. Um, whether your podcast is about travel or you're recounting the paper mache creations that you've been creating in lockdown, I'm gonna leave that up to you. But with podcasts, the important thing to remember is that the work you're gonna do today are the seeds that are going to keep growing. So podcasts are evergreen, and the episodes you create today will still be listened to months and years down the road. Um, if a podcast is something that interests you, it's a great avenue to reach travelers. And in, in a more simple term, let me put it to you this way. So even if one of your podcast episodes only has 50 listens, 
would you not be thrilled if you had 50 potential travelers attend an in-person event you held and you were able to build a relationship with them? I thought so. So let's take today to teach you how to build that podcast and to reach new audiences so that when things open up, you'll have people calling. Um, one last thing to mention before we jump in, we've got so much great info for you today that we had to break this into two segments, both of which are resource heavy. So don't worry about jotting anything down. There's going to be a lot of information. Um, and you don't need to worry about waiting for part two. Both episodes are being released at the same time and all those resources that we're gonna be talking about, we'll link to them in the episode's show notes at hostagencyreviews.com slash TAC, and then click on the episode. So today's podcast itinerary. We've got five segments for you today. We're gonna to start with technical details, recording. Um, for the second episode, we're gonna move into marketing, making the leap, and then we'll wrap it up with something that I think we could all use a little of right now, our warm fuzzy segment. We've got a lot of people's brains to pick, so let's dilly dally no longer. All right, friends, welcome to Travel Agent Channer. Uh, we've got a really fun group of people here with you today, and I wanna introduce you to them. Uh, what I've done is kind of created a variety of podcast styles that are joining us today, but they're all in the travel industry. So the audiences kind of run the gamut from consumer facing to travel trade only. The styles are solo pod or solo podcast hosts to co-hosted. And the topics are everything from cruise reviews to how to grow your travel business. Um, some of these people are doing it full time. Some are part time. Some have monetized. Some is not. But the point is to show you that there's a whole different array of podcasting styles out there um, to give you some ideas. So let's start off with the longest running podcast. Um, and Doug Parker of Cruise Radio wins that prize. He's been podcasting longer than I know, I've know. i known him. And I think I've known him for something like 10 years. Is that right, Doug? Yeah, 10 years. And you're making me go first with all these ladies and <laughs> I go first. But, uh, well, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so give us your backstory, why you started the podcast, and yeah, tell us about so, it. So yeah, I was uh, I got into radio uh, in 2001 during college. Um, did every shift imaginable from creating commercials to pushing buttons, uh, morning show, afternoon show, middays, blah blah blah. Got kind of tired of it. Um, waking up, I was my last stint was doing morning, so I had to be at the station at 3:45 a.m. So I needed a creative outlet because I was going crazy. So I started uh, Cruise Radio just for fun, really, like as a creative outlet. And then next thing you know, I started, people were listening, which I had, I knew nothing about podcasting. I knew everything in the world about the FM radio ethos, but nothing about podcasting. It was all new to me. This was 09. Um, these companies, the World Travel Holdings and such, started reaching out and wanted to buy sponsorships. And then... Here we are, you know, 10 years, uh, 11 years later. So, um, yeah, just I went from a career in radio, um, FM broadcasting to full time podcasting. And I've been doing this since 2014 full time. I left radio in 2014. You have, you have such a like uh, radio DJ voice, too. It, it never ceases to amaze me when I listen oh, no. to your podcast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and next up, we have Megan Chapa with Travel Radio. So give us a quick rundown on your podcast, Megan. Yep, Travel Radio Podcast actually started as Travel Agent Interview because I was exclusively interviewing travel agents, and uh, it came out of, I was a travel agent until like two weeks ago, which is a whole military move issue, not the COVID issue, but that's another thing, um, because I'd be at parties telling people about, oh, I know someone that does these wine cruises, or like a pole dancing cruise, or this like girls golf getaway bonanza, and they'd say, wow, my last vacation was super disappointing. I wish I had taken that vacation. So I started recording all these travel agents that I knew that had very niche specialties uh, in order to, you know, both help them, my friends, sell out their tours because sometimes they wouldn't sell and that would be sad. Or And also to introduce uh, travelers to more exciting or just different travel options they hadn't thought of before. 
and I've explained it to authors and linguists and um, sometimes an occasional supplier or um, we'll have someone on that might because people will write me and say, how can I get into travel? And so sometimes I'll do an episode that is, you know, that direction too. But mostly it's very niche specialties, trying to introduce travelers to travel professionals and uh, that do unique things. So that's what I do. And um, I'm in Oxford right now and I'm doing it part time because uh, it's, I'm momming hard right now. So, <laughs> yeah. And, and likewise, I'm sorry if my internet uh, is a little tricky, but Oxford has never done school online before. It is literally the old school. And, um, <laughs> and so we're facing some challenges right now. So uh, that's all. Thanks. Well, thanks for joining us, Megan. Uh, Christy Cameron of Travel Geniuses is another travel pro turned podcaster. So what's your story, Christy? I actually started as a home-based agent. I like to say before it was cool, like back around 9-11 when we would go to supplier events and hope nobody asked like where our office was and stuff. So um, I've been an agent for a long time and even back then was really frustrated by the lack of resources available. We didn't have host agency reviews back then or really any central place to get any information. And since then, I've become a real student of online marketing and um, business, just online business in general, and I've worked in that space a little bit too. So I decided I had all these big dreams of what I wanted to do for travel agents, and they kind of got in my way because it was like bigger than I could do. So one day I was like, forget it. I'm just going to start a podcast and see if anybody cares about anything I have to share and see if it helps. And that was, I just realized when you asked this question two years ago on April 30th is when I started the podcast. So um, it's been so great. And I hope the agents listening decide to start their own podcast. Yes, we hope so too. Uh, so let's move over to Kate Thomas, the co-host of Travel Pro Theory and the owner of North and Leisure Agency. She's an active agent. Um, but by your own accounts, Kate, you didn't really identify as a podcaster. So how did you fall into it? Yeah, so I am a supplier. Uh, so North and Leisure, I do FITs for Ireland and Scotland. And my co-host and co-founder for Travel Pro Theory is Heather Christopher. She's a travel agent. Um, I met her through a cold call <laughs> at one point. And we just got to know each other, became friends. We're each other's clients. And we started having more background conversations beyond just the like, I'm a supplier, I'm an agent, here's how we can work together kind of thing. And we had a similar experience of working for someone else and then going out on our own. And the podcast was actually my husband's idea because we were on the phone 24 seven talking industry and he was like, you should just start recording. And uh, yeah, so we did. So yeah, I would say we're podcast secondary. Our travel businesses are our primary and then Travel Pro Theory is very much a passion project, um, but what we're hoping to do with it is really open up more, more conversations because, as you guys know, the industry is very spread out, and while uh, it used to be uncommon to be a home-based agent, now like everyone is at home and very isolated, so we're just trying to kind of open that up a little bit more. Yeah, it's all the rage right now. <laughs> Um, and last but not least, we've got Lynn Blanco with the Travel Agent Podcast. Um, so you're fairly new to travel and podcasting and decided to kind of tie those two together. Tell us a little bit more. So I started my travel agency um, June of 2018 after um, getting a lot of people just asking me um, how I plan my own trips. And so I kind of decided why not jump into it? And um, I found out very quickly that it is a very difficult industry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, while I decided that I needed help, I started reaching out to travel agents who've been in the industry a while. And those um, conversations were so mind blowing and so essential to building my business in a much better way. I felt like I just couldn't keep it to myself. It just wouldn't be fair. So um, I randomly, uh, one year later, June 2019, decided to start my podcast. And uh, like most of you, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know if anybody was going to listen. And um, it's kind of turned into a thing. So uh, it's definitely part-time. So I'm part-time travel agent, part-time podcaster. Perfect. 
well, now that we've got intros out of the way, let's get this party started. Um, so let's jump into the first segment, which is kind of going over technical details. And as you can imagine, since this is an audio format, it's very difficult to go over technical things like step-by-step -step instructions on how to submit your podcast to Apple Podcast Directory, which would also be incredibly boring. Um, so we'll be giving you something even better today and something you can find on Google, which is words of advice from other podcasters and travel. So let's start with the basics. The first thing you need when you're getting started is a mic. And don't be scared. You do not need to be an audio technician to have a podcast. Um, as indicated by my like 1990s headset that I'm wearing, <laughs> the idea that I have no idea how the audio sounds. But you can definitely get into some serious gear. I know, Doug, you have tons of professional grade things too, um, but that is out of budget for most people. So what do you use, um, what would you recommend for recording equipment for newbies? Yeah, so really all you need these days is just a computer and a USB microphone. Um, you can go a couple of different ways depending on your comfort level. Like, so like there's an Audio Technica mic that's USB, you can plug it in. Um, I believe, it, is that what you're using, Kate? I believe that's what Kate's using. Um, so you just one of those. Uh, you could also have like if you're, you know, uh, don't need a mic. You could have like a lapel. Like I have an iRig right here, which is this thing, and mm -hmm. it's just a mic you clip on and put this into your phone, and I can record the podcast on the road for like my news briefs and stuff in a hotel room or wherever, just like this. Or if I don't have this, last resort, I can use my mic on my uh, voice recorder on my iPhone. So there's tons of different ways to go. There's also um, like Yeti makes a, a, a mic, a good starting mic. It's called the Nano, I believe. That's gonna run you about $100, but all those have quality sound. In fact, when I do um, segments with um, like NPR, I legit use my voice recorder and they ask me questions and I just go la 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 and then send this to the, um, the producer and they use it right from here and it sounds perfect. So like this day and age, nothing's off limits. You don't need, like back when I started, I built a $5,000 studio in my spare bedroom now you can do it with a laptop and a, or an iPhone and a few dollars, really. Magic. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just have to comment that I love that you were actually noticing what type of microphone someone else had. Because oh. I would be like, <laughs> oh, everyone's using the exact same thing. Um, <laughs> all right. So, Lynn, I know you had, in your former life, you were a music major. Um, so probably have a better ear for sound than definitely I do. So what do you use for recording? So I use, um, it's a Yeti Blue Raspberry. Um, I don't know if they make them anymore, but they, it's one of the smaller ones and it's so cute and the sound quality is awesome. Um, but when I go um, to places, I actually just use my iPhone headset and phone and voice recorder. So um, honestly, at this point, he like he's right you can use anything like you really don't need to even go buy anything if you want to do it all of it from your phone um and then transfer it to the computer you definitely can well well that was easy see so if you were nervous about getting started because you're not sure about the microphone issue we've gotten that taken care of uh so let's move into recording and editing and is it safe to say that for all of us that when we're doing these virtual interviews, we're using Zoom, Skype, um, Google Meet, or some other type of video conferencing or call conferencing program like that? Yeah. Everybody? Yeah. 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 So there's nothing fancy or tricky to learn there. I do want to mention we just, um, if you go to Host Agency Reviews blog um, and type in, um, I think, travel agent deals, we just published a post on travel agent discounts and different deals um, that can help you cut costs during coronavirus. Zoom and Google Meet both have discounts going right on right now. So that's something to take a look at if you want to start your podcast and are unsure of a, a program on Zoom and Google Meet might make that work for you. Uh, so you might be wondering if you need some special equipment to not just the microphone, but to record and kind of edit the podcast. And the answer is Essentially, yes, you will need some software. 
the nice thing about the software um, is that the recording and kind of editing are bundled into one program. So Megan, Lynn, and Christy, I know you use GarageBand for recording and editing, uh, and that comes free with Apple products. So Megan, would you quickly give us a rundown? Um, the obvious perk about GarageBand is that it's free, but in your eyes, are there any other like pros and cons of using GarageBand, like ease of use or? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it is pretty easy to use, but I actually record into a software called Ecamm. So I don't use mm. Google Zoom or Zoom or Google Hangouts. And I like Ecamm because it's, you can split the tracks really easy. In case, and like, you know, so for the purpose of using GarageBand, I want to have two tracks so that if some, because a lot of people are at home, there's going to be a dog that comes in or a kid that comes in. And when you're using yep. something that, or my kids will come in because they're relentless and they think the podcast is awesome. So, but, um, you can, and in that case, I want to be able to split the tracks so I can drop the volume or edit out a section, uh, rather than missing a whole section if we're talking over each other or the dogs and everything's on one track. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, so that's why I like GarageBand, um, but, and also because you can import a lot of things into it and the tutorials are just free and available and, um, and it's native to my laptop and so everything's going to work. Uh, so that's what, why I like it. I don't I think the drawbacks could be the learning curve, but mm -hmm. it's, I think for what you can do with it, it's worth learning because for example, my, my neighbor turned on his like washing machine or something yesterday and I was able to do a low cut and just remove that and mm -hmm. keep all the other audio. So it's, I think it's, maybe a little more advanced and also maybe a little more basic than some of the software that's out there. But if you know you have like a room that's going to be quiet, you might not need that. You might be able to go with something else. So I don't know if yeah. I really answered the question, but that's what I'm going with. No, that was perfect. Um, okay. <laughs> and, and Kate, you've gone a little bit rogue. You're not in the garage band editing software cult. Um, <laughs> am I right that you use Squadcast? Uh, it's no, it's just called cast and oh, their wow, website cast. is like, try cat. If you just Google try cast, it'll come up. And we, when we decided to start the podcast, I mean, we were like, okay, let's just roll. So we bought a mic and I Googled services and that one seemed pretty easy to use. And it really has been, it's low cost. Um, it's $10 a month covers what we need, which is like 10 hours of recording. And then they have a higher plan if you're doing a lot more recording um, but it does work well if you are doing remote recording. Uh, and because Heather and I live in different states, every episode is remote. Uh, mm -hmm. And it does exactly kind of like what Megan was saying. It records on two separate tracks. And you could do multiple guests and everyone could be remote, which is really nice. And it has some basic editing in there and, um, and just some basic analytics, too. I would say if you're like, if you want like a lot of detail on your analytics, if that's not the place for it. Uh, but if you just want something quick and easy to get started and you think that you'll be either have a co-host or guests that are remote, it works great. So what we do is I'll have that opened up and it's super easy to invite people in. You just send them a link and it pops them straight into it. Um, but it doesn't have video, it's just the audio side. So we'll have a Zoom open with that muted so that we can see each other and then have the audio recording and cast. Perfect. Um... So Christy, you also use, so you use GarageBand for your Mac and Audacity for the PC, which is another free um, editing software. Um, so how does Audacity compare to GarageBand in terms of use? I don't actually use Audacity. I just know about it for Windows oh. users. So okay. it's a free option um, if anybody has a, a Windows PC, but I have a Mac, so I just use GarageBand. It looked like a little more complicated to me, but um, I don't know. I haven't actually used it. I feel like I'm the only like non Mac user here. I'm so, <laughs> and I've got like my old headset. I'm feeling, I'm feeling very sad. <laughs> um, okay, but, Steph, so what do you use to edit? Well, I use Camtasia, which like again, but I think Christy, do you use it 
Campaign I did. I have. Yes, I did start I with did Camtasia. I did in 1990s. Yeah. <laughs> well, Camtasia is great. Well, I I use it for video editing all the time. So mm -hmm. it was just the first thing I started using because I knew it, but it was just more than I needed. So, and I had GarageBand. It didn't cost me any extra. So I just went with that. Yeah. I mean, I really like Camtasia. I think it's very similar to GarageBand um, from what I've seen when I look at people's screens. I, I don't know like the power behind it, but for me who, um, you know, just needs to do some editing and is an, an audio technician, it seems to work really well. If you're listening and the sound quality is bad, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, and Doug, you use none of these. What do you use? And any reason that you prefer that over any of the other products? Yeah, so I, I go back to, I'm using a, a pricey program. It's called Adobe Audition. But I was trained in radio on Audition back in 2000. So I just kind of stuck with what I know. Um, but I have, now you can have multiple licenses for Audition. But before I did that, I was using Audacity for um, doing shows on the road. And Audacity, back before I had the Mac, PC base, of course, but it was it's just like Adobe Audition, same functionality and everything. So it's a great program for free if you have a PC. Oh, cool, thank you. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about like a more practical thing, um, which is now we know the program. Now, how do we approach editing? So Christy, when we had chatted earlier, you commented that it was taking an hour per 15 minutes of Travel Geniuses episode um, to edit, which is kind of crazy for a part-time gig. So wh what would be your advice to new podcasters on striking the balance between too much and too little editing? Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do what I did <laughs> when I started. Just like let the perfection go. And I am even more like Megan mentioned, if there's a like something running in the background that makes noise, I just leave it. One time my, I can't say the name, my Amazon Echo thing started, mm -hmm. it must have thought I said its name. <laughs> it started, so I was like, stop, stop. And I just left it in like, People want to know you're human. And I think if you leave that stuff in and just, you can make a comment about it. But um, yeah, I just don't get <laughs> perfectionist about the editing. Um, yes. I did get real, like the reason it took me so long is because I was trying to edit out every single time I said, um, or, uh, and I just now, unless it sounds really ridiculous or I pause for a long time to collect my thoughts, I just try to leave those in. Um, and just train myself to not say them as often. But yeah, just let the perfection go and make it easy and just be human. Do what you can do. It's better to put something out that's not perfect than to get caught in trying to make it perfect and not do it or make it too hard. Mm -hmm. and, and that's great advice for like as the host of the show. Megan, when we had chatted, you talked about mm -hmm. kind of the guest end of things. When you're interviewing your guests, they may be mm -hmm. really nervous and that can create a lot of editing work, which is something yeah. to think about. So what do you suggest um, doing to try to combat that? I like to send them a format. Like I want to have a candid conversation with you. So don't tell me everything up front. Is there any concern you have before this, before we get started? Um, is what I email them out. This is what I print. I'm not going to give you any surprises. And if mm -hmm. a conversation, just like if I think of a question, it's not going to be an I got your question. It's going to be something that I'm, I'm confident you're confident talking about. And then I try to talk to them about 10 minutes before they actually know we're recording. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. sometimes you get a good piece of information that, you know, we had, they tell me, and then I have my authentic reaction. And I wish that that would have been later. So as long as they give me that, and I'll tell them at the end, hey, I was recording. I just wanted you to feel comfortable. And that segment was better. I'm just going to slide it up. Is that okay? But I think being able to give them a good format ahead of time, telling them that, you know, this isn't, I'm not going to try to trip you up in some manner. I want this to be good for you too. I want you to be proud of it and show your friends and family. I want it to be good. And so this is what I propose saying. And then at the end, if I've missed anything, I give them the opportunity to go back or correct or interject and, you know, tell them like, this is, I want it to be a conversation. You're, you can ask me questions too. And you don't even have, you don't have to tell me ahead of time. Just throw that at me. It's fine. Um, but sometimes just look at a really nervous one and then that will create quite a bit of editing. 
and that's mm-hmm. okay. So. And Doug, you have some tricks up your sleeve as well. So even if the interviews go really well. There's still editing that needs to be done. You need to add in intros, outros, if there's like a commercial spot. Um, mm-hmm. So when you're recording too, how do you keep track of mistakes so you don't waste time trying to find the places you need to edit? Yeah, so I'm clumsy. So I, you can actually set a marker on Adobe Audition, but I don't do that because I'm afraid if I hit something, I'm going to stop the recording. So I just, I tie mark with my, with a pad and paper and just look at the time mark. And if something goes sideways, I'll put down like 1611 or whatever the time mark is. And I'll go back and correct 1611 if I have to. Um, but I also agree with like, I have like with Megan, I have a pre-cruise review sheet I send out. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, my templates been the same for the past 11 years. And so listeners are pretty accustomed to what I'm going to ask, but just for a comfort level so they can jot down notes or whatever about the dining or the stateroom or whatever. And then also I leave all the uhs and ums and everything in there because it's natural conversation. Like Christy said, Um, it's just, yeah, it's a natural conversation. Like you're talking with some friends on a nervous level. If people are nervous, um, I normally have like a 10 minute, just shoot the stuff with them for 10 minutes about the weather or how far are you from the airport? Just things that, it kind of calms them down, especially whenever I say, hey, how's it going? And they're like, oh, good. Are we doing this now? Are we recording? Like they start freaking out. So it's kind of like walking them off the ledge by just having a normal conversation. And sometimes I'll even, I'll hit record and don't even tell them just to kind of slowly segue into the interview. So they'll never know. And they're like, when are we going to record? I'm like, we already did. <laughs> so, Magic. Yeah. Um, and, and you also streamline editing by having a template for every one of your episodes. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So uh, let me back up and say that I, I record, but my template says all calls are subject to be recorded. So I'm not just like recording and they don't know it. They know calling in that they're going to be recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as a template, yeah, because I have commercial spots. I have my voice guy who does intros and outros for me and calls to action. So my template's the same every week. And I just basically interchange my cruise news segment and my interview and then save it. And then, so it saves a lot of time because everything else is basically the same every single week, unless I change up a commercial or change up the intro or refresh some liners. Um, so it's, you know, having a template, is good to, uh, you know, streamline things, you know, you're not having to build something from scratch every single time. Yes. Um, I just saw that. I don't know if Kim Tisha had this prior, I just saw that they had templates after Doug and I were talking. I was like, that sounds like it would be really helpful. <laughs> um, does anyone else's editing software do templates? Um, like, no. GarageBand doesn't do templates, but you can record your intro separate and your outro separate, save them, export them as an MP3, and then you can mm-hmm. add them into your loops. And mm-hmm. then I just favorite that. And so each episode, I'm like, bring up my favorites intro outro pop it in mm-hmm. yeah so there all right so one of the things you'll well you don't have to but you'll probably work with when you're editing your podcast is adding some music in it's not a necessity but it is nice to have the the trick is you just can't put your favorite music in there you'll need to make sure it's royalty free and Kate I know you don't have music on Travel Pro Theory, but Lynn, you have some on yours. Where did you get yours from? So I just did a Google search for royalty free music um, for podcasts. Uh, Google is amazing. Um, <laughs> and several uh, things came up. And honestly, at this point, um, I'm kind of scared. I don't remember where I got it from. It was a deal. I, it was $12.99. I got three 30 second, three 30 second clips and um, you just download them. And I picked one of the, out of the three that I liked the best and just put my voice over it. So if anything was to happen, and I had to re-record it. I don't know if I'd be able to um, <laughs> find that website, but there's tons of them. Yeah. And, and Megan, how about travel radios music? Yeah, my music uh, is from GarageBand, but like 10 GarageBands ago. So <laughs> I don't know if it's still available. So thankfully I saved that all as you know filed and i didn't and i i actually saved it in another place also 
so that when I switched computers, if it didn't come with, I still had it. So it's just um, a loop that was in GarageBand and there's tons of them and you can download, what you're looking for is a sound library. And so you can look for a sound library or music, uh, you know, MP3 library. And some of them you can do like five downloads for free before you have to pay for anything. So you can get like, I don't know, if you want to boot people out, you can get boops and beeps and car horns and whatnot. So there's, <laughs> so that's what you're looking for is a sound library. And there are a ton of them. And so you don't need to pay for music to get started. There's tons out there. So Yeah. And Camtasia has like an asset library that comes through free with the subscription mm -hmm. um, or with the product, which is really nice. That has the sound library. Um, and there, there's actually also subscription services. And Christy, you go that route. Who do you use and why do you choose the subscription route? Well, I got mine through Audio Jungle, which has thousands and thousands of anything you could want. Um, and it was the license to buy the license was like $13 a season. So every time like I start a new season or just a new year of the podcast, I just renew the license for that. So um, that has a lot of options too. And Lynn, that might be where yours came from. <laughs> <laughs> um, Doug, you also do subscription services. Same question as Christy. You, who do you use and why? Why? Yeah, so kind of weird given the current, uh, current climate, but it's called Epidemic Sound. <laughs> and it's $15 a month. But it's the reason why I am doing this and not doing the uh, more affordable route is because I'll have my voice guy cut an intro for me, but then I'll take that intro and make 10 different files with that intro. So a soft open, a hard open, a cold open, I'll use all these different styles. If I'm going to come out strong, I want a nice boom. If I want to cut, you know, come in soft, ease in. So I kind of just have all these files to choose from where I don't have to pay like per song or pay a license for just, you know, 10 sound bites. Um, I use that just because, and also um, Epic Sound or uh, Epidemic Sound, it links to your YouTube account. So I auto import my shows, my new shows over to YouTube. So if I'm using some random file um, that I didn't pay for, it would shut me down and give me a copyright strike. So with, with Epidemic Sound, I actually link my YouTube account to my Epidemic account, and then everything's kind of kosher. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, um, those are great tips. So we're just kind of trucking along and building our podcast here. We've got ideas for microphones, recording, editing, music, um, and we're almost ready to push it to the masses. But first, we need to find somewhere where you can host your podcast. So those that are unfamiliar with that, just like you have a host for your agency's website, we need to create a central place that's going to store your podcast that everybody can get feeds from and it can go to all the different directories. That sounded like a bunch of garbly good to you. We'll, we'll kind of go through it a little bit more. Um, so Kate, you're all about ease and simplicity with Travel Pro Theory. What podcast hosting service like fits the bill for you? Um, cast. So the same thing we use to record and edit, it's all in there after um, an episode's done, I do, um, you know, like download it and save it offline as a backup. Um, but yeah, when you get started, they kind of walk you through the process of um, setting up your RSS feed and getting that all ready initially. Uh, so we did that at the beginning. We started by backloading. We had three episodes ready to roll um, just because we decided if someone wanted to listen to episode one and liked it enough to keep going when we started to just build some traction. Mm -hmm. um, so we... We had a few ready, and once we set up the RSS feed, it was just a matter of getting it submitted to iTunes and Spotify and Google Play. And now I don't do any of that. As soon as I hit publish and cast, it goes to those places, and I don't have to think about it, which is exactly what I want. <laughs> yes. And Megan, you're over at fireside.fm. Give us your elevator pitch and why the $19 a month is money well spent. Uh, because I didn't, I was using SoundCloud and I was using Spreaker and I was just on these different platforms. It was like, you reach this limit, you reach that limit. You can only do this many hours, you, this storage, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I'm just so frustrated with this. So for me, it was also ease of use, but I didn't, um, 
I have a background in the music industry, so I kind of didn't need the cast type approach. I, I wanted to use the garage band and they have, it also gives you a front facing consumer website if you want it. That's beautiful mm -hmm. and easy to use. And it also pushes out your RSS feed, which means like your RSS feed is, is the data. It's your, it's, it's your, when you send it out, it sends out your podcast to all these places and it sends it out to, I mean, darn near everywhere if you want it to. So, and then it has beautiful metrics. So I feel like they are not quite accurate as far as I think they get their regions. Like I cannot possibly have as many people subscribing from Poland as I do. But mm, I, don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you can at least see a, a beautiful trend that if you wanted to, um, you know, pitch to a, an advertiser, you could show great statistics. And then also it has really cool backend feature that if you had it, an advertiser, you can show them, you know, you can send them basically this backend thing, you, you like with a timestamp so they can just listen to their advertisement and then it can show you their statistics right there. So it has some good backend features that I, that I really like. And, mm -hmm. the, and it's like, I don't, I don't know, it's really easy. And if you want, if you have a problem, you write to them and Dan, who developed it, writes you back. So it's great. That's perfect. Um, I, I myself use SoundCloud. Um, you get three hours for free and then it costs $12 a month. And I've, I've, I've been happy with it. Um, but their focus is definitely less on podcasts and more on music. So it's, um, from what I gather, it's not as feature risk rich as other podcast focused hosts, but I'm, I'm totally okay with it because I don't really want to move it over somewhere else. So um, but well, there are other options out there. Can I say one thing about SoundCloud? Yeah. If you if you want to do a monthly podcast and you mm -hmm. only need three hours, that would be perfect. Well, it's only three. It's not three hours a month. It's three hours total. So it, for me, it was really nice because I only do it quarterly. So that was like three quarters of a year. I didn't have to pay for anything, <laughs> which is why I did it. Um, but I know we've got a few people on Lisbon, which starts at $5 a month. And Doug, you've been there since you started. What are the pros and cons in your eyes? I don't have any cons for Libsyn. Um, the pros, I've never had an issue with my podcast being pushed out. And I mean, I, I put out 104 on cruise radio uh, a year and 365 cruise news briefs a year. So I've never had one issue with anything um, with them. Everything is, yeah, I mean, like you said, it's staggered pricing. So five, five is going to get you like just a, a few megabytes a month. I'll be, I think I pay for 20 right now, which is like, um, I'm sorry, I pay $20 for like 400 megabytes, but I get like the extra uh, data as well. So it's showing me the kind of device they're downloading on, whether it's like Android or I, iPhone or whatever. Um, it also shows me the region they're coming from and also like from Spotify, iHeartRadio wherever they're listening to the podcast from, it shows me all that data with the, with the more expensive pricing, but just starting out, you could totally do it for like five or seven bucks a month. Mm -hmm. And, and Christy and Lynn, you're also Lisbonites. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Lynn, you had mentioned you're on Lisbon, but you like captivate.fm better. Uh, tell us more about that. Um, so I, have been encouraging everyone I know to start podcasts and really just trying to figure out the easiest way to create like a program to kind of give people to, to make it super easy. And Captivate FM to me um, was one of the absolute easiest um, startups um, and you can have multiple podcasts. So in my house, um, I, since I love podcasting, I've told my husband and my kids, that's like a project, you know, everyone in the house has to have their own um, podcast. Well, on Captivate FM, you can have multiple um, podcasts on one $20 a month subscription, as long as you have under 10,000 subscribers a month. So on Libsyn, it's $20 and it, um, and you can only have one. So um, we basically kind of just use both because I'm not going to move my current podcast over to Captivate FM, but all of the family's podcasts are, you know, on Captivate, but it is super, super simple. It sounds very similar to cast. Um, you can do everything in there and their websites are beautiful um, that they give you. So you don't actually have to go and pay, you know, Google or GoDaddy for a website. Um, 
So I, I love it. I think it's great. Well, I love the idea that you have your kids and your family doing podcasts during the lockdown. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, Gotta do something. I know. Well, okay. All right, team. We've got one last technical thing to talk about, and that's submitting the podcast to directory because we have the host that holds it. Um, now we need to submit it to places like Google Play or Apple Podcasts. Um, it sounds scary and it sounds time consuming, but it isn't. Um, Kate, let's get rid of the mystique. Did you find it challenging or time consuming to figure out how to publish the podcast on different directories? No, um, not at all. Once, once um, we had the RSS feed set up in Cast, it was just a matter of going through and submitted. And we didn't go. We don't go for everything. We were like, let's just hit the top. We need iTunes. We need Spotify. We threw in Google Google Play for good measure. And um, if I'm remembering correctly, like the process of submitting took me, you know, a few minutes. It's writing your description. It's uploading your art, tagging your categories. Uh, if you have a potty mouth like we do, marking explicit, and then, <laughs> and then that's it. I think iTunes took the longest in terms of like the time to get approved. I want to say it was maybe a week or so. Um, but once once you get that email saying you're good to go, you're good to go. It's ready to roll. Yeah, and Doug, you're really strategic uh, with distributing your podcast. So tell us how. Lisbon works for that. And then tell us a little bit about your strategy for smaller directories and YouTube. Yes. Yeah, so like with Libsyn on the dashboard there, you have the um, option to submit like to Google Music, uh, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Pandora, like all these directories. All you have to do is just add the description, add your art and basically submit it. And it auto submits all these for you. Um, also with, um, with YouTube as well, you can just connect to your account, um, and it auto pushes it out just as a file, um, an audio file, but with your logo as the cover throughout the whole, whether it be 30 minutes or whatever. Um, and that's pretty much like, a, I also have found other directories too. Like listeners will email me and say, Hey, I'm listening on whatever dot or whatever, I don't see your podcast, or I listen to my podcast on this, can you get yours in there? So then I'll like Google rover.com or whatever it is, and then put in my RSS feed to get listed in there. But because there are directories outside of Libsyn, like um, TuneIn Radio and Stitcher Radio and things like that, where you want to, um, you know, just make sure you're listed because you never know where people are, how they how they consume their podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just have to say before... <laughs> I have the one problem I have with Lipson is it's really hard to say. <laughs> Why did they choose anyhow? So, um, okay. So holy smokes, um, time flew by as we're kind of going through the technicalities. And I was hoping to kind of smush this all into one episode like we normally do. But honestly, there was just way too much info. Um, and I didn't want it to be rushed. So, we're going to get a little bit crazy, and we're going to do our first ever two-part show. Um, just because we're ending this show right now doesn't mean the party's stopping. Um, join us at the after party, which is to say tune in to volume 15, and that's um, where the party's going to continue. So during that episode, we'll kind of discuss strategies when it comes to how often you need to publish, how to make sure your um, episodes are pulling up in search, and the best ways to promote your podcast. So there's no need to wait in anticipation either. Normally we publish quarterly, but we're going to drop these shows at the exact same time. And it's just waiting for you to take a listen. So thank you, Megan, Christy, Kate, Doug, and Lynn for joining us on today's show. And thank you for dialing in. I'll see you at the after party. That was a lot of info, eh? Well, don't you worry. We've got your back. So you can watch a video, read a transcript, and read the show notes of today's episode, which there's going to be a lot of them, by visiting hostagencyreviews.com slash TAC and clicking on episode 14. If you're liking this info, feel free to share it with a friend that you think might make a great podcast host to get them all fired up. And if you really like the episode, make sure to sign up for our newsletter to ensure you never miss another episode of TAC. Plus, my dog has a section in the newsletter where he's dressed as an astronaut, and you really can't beat that. No one ever reads it, but I love it. 
Visit hostagencyreviews.com slash newsletter to sign up for the monthly newsletter that comes out on the full moon every month. Thanks for listening. Be safe. Be well. We're going to get through this. And most importantly, keep your head up. Things are rough out there, but you're not alone. Keep your eyes focused on the kindness and beauty that has popped up as a result of this unprecedented situation. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and be well, my friends. 